I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Michael Perone, the founder of Sanrel LLC, a material science and manufacturing startup focused on developing cutting-edge technology solutions for a variety of energy, transportation, and environmental challenges. Michael's career includes past roles as a materials development scientist at Voxel 8, visiting researcher at Wooster Polytechnic Institute, materials engineer at Solvus Global, and a piezoelectric researcher at Piezo System Jaina before his okay. current role at that San was marketing, Rock. actually, but close enough. <laughs> he joins us today with initial thoughts and insights on the LK99 room temperature superconductor story. So, Michael, welcome. This is a breaking story, and actually, people have been asking me for the last like two days, I think they're like, you have to cover this. You have to cover this. And so yesterday you and I actually had a conversation and you were describing some of the challenges involved with replication. I was like, you know what, this is the person that I need to talk to. So what, this is all very initial, right? This story is changing rapidly, but for everybody out there, who's, you know, just basically hoping for details, um, you are the person to provide them. And then both of us have been doing a little bit of research. Uh, so let me start out with some of the basics here, I guess. Um, there, in two papers uploaded to the preprint server archive on July 22nd, a South Korean research team claimed to have created a room temperature superconductor, so room temperature and ambient pressure, that's also important, uh, using a new lead-based compound they named LK99. The process to create it requires three materials, copper, phosphorus, and lead, which are all easily available, right? Does that sound Probably accurate? also oxygen, but that's way more available. Yeah. So uh, let, let me see. It, one of the two papers published had several scientists listed. The other only had three, and there are actually a couple different reasons for that. Um, the paper titled... The first room temperature ambient pressure superconductor was authored by Sukbai Li, Jihoon Kim, Yung Wan Kwan, and there was speculation that only having three author authors may be related to the fact that a Nobel Prize can only be awarded at most to three people, right? So, um, so I guess in terms of the material itself, Again, just doing a little bit of research, determining whether a material qualifies as a superconductor requires two distinct criteria, exhibiting absolute zero resistance and complete diamagnetism or the quality of being repelled by a magnet. In this case, we have videos. Videos are out there that seem to indicate that it does exhibit the Meissner effect. It levitates over a magnet. And presumably, we have absolute zero resistance. Although one of the things that you have said is this material tends to be created as superconducting domains or crystals inside of a larger substrate that's not superconducting, right? Yeah, that's part of the challenge in, in synthesizing this material is they're taking, uh, they're, they're essentially growing crystals of this material in a lead sulfate flux. Uh, so that's, this, that's a similar process to crystallization in, in geophysics in the earth. And it's very slow. That's why it takes four days. And you've got areas with the lead phosphate surrounded by areas with lead sulfate comp general composition. Um, so the lead phosphate is slowly crystallizing out and growing. Um, and um, I'm not sure whether it's liquid or solid at that temperature, but if it's a solid solid uh, phase transition sort of thing, or, or um, if they're annealing it as a solid, it's even a slower process. So it just, it just takes a long time. Um, and yeah, uh, to get a good measurement of that conductivity, you need to be sure that you've got a single crystal to work with uh, of the material you're actually measuring. So part of the issue with getting the measurement is, uh, well, to get a measurement of superconductivity, um, I mean, there's a few ways. Um, I'm familiar with four-point probes. Uh, that way you can measure the contact resistance and cancel it all out. Um, to get the real resistance value. And you can get extreme resolution out of that. And there are other methods as well. Um, but yeah, even just finding, just making like you have this block of non-homogeneous material with crystals in it. Um, and you're trying to find a spot where you can actually probe uh, an actual sample of it. And it doesn't help that the sulfate salt and the phosphate salt are very close in color. 
So it's tricky to know what you're actually putting the probe tips on. Um, anyway, um, the, yeah, you were you were going to continue. Yeah, well, and and so I think that that helps. I, what I am seeing is, and I'll, I'll come to this in a bit, but there was one replication that they claim is successful. There have been a couple others where people have said there was a replication and very little detail, right? So I don't even know if those count. Um, and then there are a couple of folks who have attempted it, but not had success. And so one of the things that I wanted to get out there was, um, this is, again, this story is only, it's only really made headlines the last couple of days. Folks are just starting to attempt replications and everything is very initial, but there are lots of questions because the stakes are so high, right? So I, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's part of it. Um, so let me ask how this might compare to a YBCO type two superconductor. The reason I ask is that is the most familiar. It's the most common, I believe. Um, certainly if you like, if you look online at any kind of, you know, superconductor levitation videos or anything along those lines, those are all YBCO type two superconductors, right? Where they put the liquid nitrogen on them and, you know, yeah. Uh, how would this compare to those? Do you think? Yeah, so uh, there's a lot of features here. Um, it appears to be a type two superconductor because the transition for a type one superconductor, uh, the transition is very fast as you go down in temperature, it's very sudden. Um, but for a type two superconductor, generally speaking, uh, the transition to the superconducting state will be very gradual with some parts of the material becoming superconducting before others. And then eventually it all transitions through that. Um, so it's called a second order phase transition instead of first order phase transition due to the, the smoothing there. Um, so um, not only that, but it has a very wide phase transition. So yes, it is superconducting at room temperature technically, but uh, just barely. So it can support 200 milliamps at room temperature. To get to practical applications, you're still going to have to cool this thing down probably with, I mean, you don't need to use liquid nitrogen at this point maybe, but at least uh, uh, maybe some mixture of dry ice and acetone um, or triacetin, which uh, is a good salt solvent for these. Um, I think might be frozen. Anyway, you get a solvent and and dry ice and that should do the trick. And it's a lot, eas a lot easier to work with potentially than liquid nitrogen. Oh. Um, Okay. Well, so, if, uh, but it's still it's still for practical applications with high amperage, you're still going to need um, uh, some cooling for something like this because the transition uh, region is so large. It goes through the whole. Um, it, it goes like all the way down to room temperature, all, and all the way up to 130, uh, 127 C or so, uh, based on the claims, um, and, and below room temperature a bit too. Um, so uh, in terms of YBCO, uh, there, there are four, I believe, uh, density field theory simulations out uh, simulating the material so far. Uh, it, it, it appears to be a strongly correlated electron material, which is common for type two super con uh, superconductors. Um, it uh, appears to have strong electron phonon coupling. That suggests that the mechanism is uh, bipolaronic superconductivity, uh, similar maybe to uh, mercury ammonia solutions and some other things that uh, we were planning on testing later, but this seems a lot more practical um, potentially. So that's exciting. Um, but yeah, bipolaronic superconductivity is basically just analogous. It is, well, it's, it's roughly analogous to uh, BCS theory, which is the standard theory. Um, well, type two superconductivity isn't really BCS theory anyway. That's a whole other can of worms. But um, the bipolaron mechanism, it just uh, enhances the uh, coupling associated with Cooper pairs by a factor of like a thousand. So you can get stuff near room temperature instead. Um, so those are sorts of things we're looking for in, in those areas. And uh, the bipolaronic coupling is so strong because of the lattice strain induced in the materials. So um, there's a, a series of papers over the past decade or two where they found if they take a single layer of graphene or uh, like there's ma magic angle graphene, for example, as a superconductor, um, 
part of that has to do with the maybe with the lattice strain of the two like the lattices aren't lined up together so some of these uh atoms have more strain on the bonds than others in a in a predictable pattern um and uh like ybco uh if you put it on different oxide substrates if you put a single layer on other substrates then the transition temperature changes you can increase or decrease the transition temperature and then as you add more layers stacked on top of that uh, the change in the transition temperature goes away. And that has long been theorized to be due to lattice-induced strain. So whatever substrate you put the YBCO on, uh, the spacing of the atoms is different than on the YBCO on top of there. Um, so if you, um, if you have a single layer, you're going to have much more strain. But if you have multiple layers, that strain will be relieved It'll it'll, uh, it'll out. Well, and, and so and that, it, yeah. So this let, is the sort of me, mechanism. Let me jump in just a second. In terms of lattice strain, and again, I'm no expert on this, but I did do an interview with uh, Dr. Ranga Diaz a, a couple of years ago. And he had a claim for a room temperature superconductor, but with a caveat. The caveat was he used a, a diamond anvil vice to put pressure on his substance, which pushed the, basically he created the lattice strain externally. And that pushed the hydrogen atoms close enough together to create the configuration he needed for superconductivity. I believe he ended up retracting his paper. And if I remember correctly, the reason was because um, basically it was promoted as being a room temperature superconductor, but at the same time, the tremendous pressures involved um, didn't really factor into that. And so what you're saying, and I believe what I've read is in this case, rather than using external pressure to squeeze those atoms into a strained state, they're actually using the chemistry itself to create internal strain. And, and that creates the electron configuration they need, right? Yeah, exactly. So like uh, on, on, on chemistry YouTube, there's a bunch of people trying to synthesize something called cubane. It's a uh, it's eight carbon atoms in a cube as as the corners of the cube, and carbon really doesn't want to take that shape. So there's a tremendous amount of strain on the bonds that makes it incredibly energetic as a compound. So it, it readily explodes and stuff. Um, so uh, that's I mean, I mean hopefully it's not explosive. <laughs> well, I, I mean it's it's being heated up a lot, so I guess we'll. Yeah, uh, but th this is, yeah, you can you can store a tremendous amount of chemical energy in the bond strain. And uh, in many cases, the order of magnitude of that energy is comparable to these diamond anvil cell compression experiments, which is why, in principle, you could create lattice-induced strain by doping a material, for example, with copper in this case. Um, and you could deform the unit cells of the lattice and impart this the strain. Um, ah. it, it can be tricky to, oftentimes, if you have such strain and then you try to anneal your material, it will take on a different crystal structure to relieve the strain. Okay. But in this case, uh, it retains that and the crystal structure is very stable. So um, in that case, it's, it, it's a little it's a little bit of a balancing act to get both. So um, like nitinol, if you if you take nitinol, you can put all sorts of strains in the crystal, and then you heat it up, and those disappear. So uh, it's it's not usually a very stable condition, but in this case, it appears to be. Okay. So that's, yeah. Yeah, well, let, so let me run through some of the replication stuff. And again, we have pros and cons here. So I'll start with the pro. South China Morning Post just reported a replication by a student team from the Wazhong University of Science and Technology, or HUST. Uh, they synthesized a tiny crystal, just micrometers in diameter, under and, and under a microscope, they proceeded to demonstrate its anti-magnetic uh, levitating properties. They posted a video of that online, which is making headlines across China right now. So that's that's on the pro side of things. Um, on the con side of things, actually, I have two. Wired Magazine reported that, quote unquote, experts are doubtful. Um, 
Let me see. Multiple versions of the LK99 paper have appeared online with inconsistent data, reportedly the result of warring between authors about the precise nature of the claim. And then the Daily Beast was also very critical, saying, let, let me see, the, and this is a quote. It says, uh, the story was, sorry, but the new LK99 superconductor breakthrough might be total BS. They quoted Professor Jens Koch from Northwestern University, who said, I take the announcement with a proverbial grain of salt, although this proverbial grain seems to be closer to the size of a rock. This is an area of research where breakthrough claims have been made in the past and had to be retracted because they didn't hold up under scrutiny. Some of my colleagues have already voiced concerns about data presented by the South Korean group. So, so again, a, kind of a mixture of good and bad, but at least one replication claim that seems fairly credible. And I believe you, you've seen some others as well, right? I think they may be the same one. In fact, I don't know. Um, it sounds like it's the same one, at least for, based on your description of it. Um, but um, I would say it's a little early to be making claims for or against. And um, with any uh, breakthrough this big, uh, I'm, I'm not surprised if the authors are fighting over credit and things. It's uh, It sometimes happens. Uh, I mean, and the, the inconsistencies in the paper as well, that could also be to help um, prevent other people from, they, they might actually want to prevent other people from synthesizing it so that uh, their patent is more defensible and things. It's it's a huge mess. So um, I would recommend that instead of the news headlines, if you really want to keep up to date with this, go to ArcSiv, see the papers that are coming out. Uh, yeah. For the most part, they're more level-headed at the moment. Well, and so I am going to put links into those. There is a new one. I haven't even had a chance to re review it yet, but it just came out. It's by the same authors. Um, and Ooh, nice. you, you you also provided me with several links to Twitter and different resources. I will put those in the show notes. So anybody who kind of wants to come up to speed on this can use those. Well, um, I would like to go over them as if we have time. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It, you know, again, I should point out that everything is very initial. In fact, I had just read about someone actually has a live stream. They have a camera pointed at their furnace while they try <laughs> this four day heating process. We should and do so that on Jeremy's channel. They're doing it. They're doing a, a countdown, a countdown to crystal growth, right? For the superconductor. Nice. Um, nice. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, if you want to, you know, do you want to do screen share? We can bring these papers up. Uh, do you mind grabbing it on your computer? I'm less familiar with. Uh, sure, with sure. Computer. Yeah, let 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 me do that. Okay, let me start with this one. Uh, okay. The first room temperature ambient pressure superconductor. There we go. And again, here are our authors. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, what are your thoughts on this? So, if we go in the paper and just do do a quick look through. Let's see, down a little further. Let's see the data here. Keep going. Okay, I will go to cool. page three. Is that what you were looking for? So DC magnetization and stuff. Yeah, so here's the standard thing we, we're seeing here. So there's some effect, for example, at 398 Kelvin, but look how small that effect is. You're only getting a couple milliamps of current. And at room temperature, 298K roughly, you're getting about uh, 250 milliamps of current total. Um, that's the maximum, uh, that's the critical current that the superconductor can support apparently. Um, so as I was saying, not very useful for room temperature stuff. Um, although I shouldn't say that completely because many of the functions in modern day phones are around the milliamp range. So this, could still potentially be used in a lot of the internal like computational traces and whatnots in uh in circuit boards for phones. Okay. Or... And, and and so if I could if I could translate a little bit, hopefully I'm doing this right. In terms of critical current, what you're saying is this thing is superconducting at room temperature, but there are severe limits, right? A couple of hundred milliamps. If mm -hmm. you go over that, it quits being a superconductor. Yeah, yeah, and there, there's many applications in uh, in modern electronics where this may be sufficient. Um, 
And additionally, uh, you could have uh, superconducting qubits that are these low milliamp ridges uh, in your phone. Now, there would be a lot of noise you'd still have to deal with because the temperature is so high, but the actual superconductivity at least would be stable. So this opens up a lot of interesting things. Like you could have superconducting, uh, you could have superconducting quantum interference devices in your phone to do brain scanning and stuff. Which I don't know. Some people might not like that, but uh, that's possible, I suppose. Uh, let's continue down. There's uh, some magnetization experiment here. I'm not exactly sure what that one's saying, but we can see critical temperature, critical here, current. Let me, let me put it right there. How's that look? Yeah. So. Um, so yeah, critical current goes up as we uh, go down in temperature. And um, it's not going up super fast, really. And they, that's still two, the 250 milliamps or so uh, around room temperature. So if we go down to like negative 80 C, we're talking about a couple of amps. So, I mean, hopefully this uh, curve keeps going up in terms of the critical current. So because... Ultimately, the utility of a superconductor for fusion reactors and similar things is limited by the critical current it can achieve, and we still don't seem to have that data here. So if we continue down. Okay. So that, I believe, is it for this page. Do you want me to go down to the next graph? Yeah. Okay. And I'm just going by the uh, the slides on the left here. So there are more. Yeah. So it seems okay. to have a copper sulfide impurity. So that may be an issue with replicating the experiment. For some people, uh, if they're using extremely pure materials um, or uh, so what they're doing in the experiment is they're taking uh, lead sulfate and lead oxide and mixing those into a, a salt melt. And um, then they're adding copper phosphide and the copper phosphide uh, apparently is reducing the sulfur somewhat and re replacing that. So you get uh, phosphate ions and sulfur instead. And some residual sulfur remains in the crystal structure, apparently. Um, so for people who are just trying to throw together the oxides of these materials, there may be some reason why it doesn't work. Um, for okay. example, um, the, cop the, the extra phosphorus and copper might act as some sort of flux uh, during the, during the uh, or they may nucleate crystal growth. We'll, we'll just have to see. Uh, ah. go for it. Yep. Okay. So let me go to the next set of slides, and I'm going to have to zoom out. I think a little bit here. Yeah. So so actually, this is a this is a perfect example here. You see this. Um, there's got there's some black patches in there, and then there's this gray material. I suspect the black patches are the actual superconductor, and the the, re the remaining gray material is probably a relatively poor conductor. So that's why uh, we may be seeing in some of the results, uh, it, the resistance doesn't actually drop all the way to zero. Uh, but it, there's multiple phases stable in this salt mixture when it's molten. And one of them is the superconductor, and one of them is just some other sulfate salt. Um, it, it appears to be, at least. So, um, so yeah, like those little chocolate chip things in there, those, those are the actual superconductor. And um, it's going to be a bit of a pain to actually... Uh, it might be a, a bit of a pain to manufacture this at scale because um, you're going to have to crystallize those out of solution, out of the sulfate salt solution. And then um, you're going to have to somehow separate the sulfate salt from the phosphate salt. You'll probably have to find some deep eutectic solvent that dissolves just the sulfate and not the phosphate. And then, um, well, I, I'm not sure, uh, you'd, you'd probably take that superconducting powder, uh, crush it up, and um, put it in a copper tube, and then like roll the copper tube through a roller to press the superconducting powder together. That's the way that they used to make superconducting wires uh, maybe a decade ago. Uh, because, uh, well, or, or at least before they, the, so these days the way superconducting wire is made for fusion applications and high current applications is they, they have a strip of copper coated with silver and then they uh, vapor deposit YBCO on the silver. And then they add additional layers for mechanical strength. And um, the vapor depositing thing, that that gives you way more, uh, it gives you better quality crystals that are all aligned more or less and um, very fewer, fewer grain boundaries between crystals and better contact as well between crystals. 
So the critical currents you can achieve with those sorts of uh, vapor deposited things are much higher than you can possibly get with this. Um, if you want to vapor deposit this superconducting material, uh, it would probably make more sense to start from the mixed salt of the lead oxide, lead phosphate, and all the other stuff, and then just vapor deposit that or sputter coat it. And uh, then you'd have to find a substrate that nucleates the right crystal growth. And then you'd have a different problem. But you're not going to make that sort of superconducting wire with this material process, probably. Um, there's, um, but the other thing is, if you start with the lead phosphate, lead oxide salt, then uh, you should be able to, uh, you should be able to take this, the powder of superconducting crystals from this and pack it around the uh, brick of superconducting uh, glass. Uh, so you, you make a lead phosphate, lead oxide glass with the copper and stuff, just make it as a glass. And then you, you just coat it with these crystals and then you anneal it. And those crystals should, some of them should nucleate crystal growth into the mm. main piece of glass. And then you'll have a solid chunk um, the other way you could potentially do that is uh, the way they make silicon pools. They take a seed crystal and they have a, a melt of molten silicon, and then they pull the seed crystal up from the melt under very carefully controlled uh, temperature gradients. And those uh, the crystal growth matters uh, to fractions of a degree Celsius. Like uh, it's it's extremely it's an extremely sensitive process to make silicon pools, and. Uh, it's really something we should have more capability to do here in the U.S. It's one of those things that I wish uh, they would uh, they would do more in here. Just how critical like silicon wafers are for everything. Uh, but but yeah. Anyway, if you could get a machine that does that, uh, you take the superconducting uh, particles here, um, take a slightly larger crystal, use it as a seed crystal, just touch it to the molt uh, the molten phosphate glass, and then and then pull it slowly. And carefully. Okay. And in theory, you should be able to grow wires that way. Um, they'd be super expensive, though, but they'd be very high current if they're a solid crystal of material. Uh, more likely, you'd grow pools that they're larger in diameter, and then you would cut them to shape. Um, yeah, and and that gets you around the grain boundaries. But as you'd mentioned now, and again, I want to point this out for the audience, what they would be new, doing initially is probably like taking the crystals which are again kind of like chocolate chips in this in this cookie so to speak they would be taking those out basically crushing them up and putting them into something similar to like a straw right and and, and so you can imagine if you can imagine something like fiber optic cable where you have probably have like a plastic insulator on the outside on the inside you have this crystalline powder with lots of grain boundaries and so it's it's going to have resulting issues there you know it's not mm. going to be not going to have the critical current capacity you were saying, things like that. And it's also less mechanically sound as well, because there's no metallurgical bonding inside any of there. It's just it's just held together by compression. Yeah. 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 So that that would be initial. Uh, and then let me go down to this one. OK, let's see. Um, these appear to be simulations of the material, so they're less relevant for the reality of things, but uh, they motivated the study, I suppose. So uh, let's keep going, though. Okay, and there is one more down here. Ah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the heat capacity appears to change um, with temperature. That's fine. Uh, DBA temperatures. Um, these are suggestive of superconductivity near room temperature as well, in general, uh, but just barely. Um, like there's a little dip around 200 here for the heat capacity. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, there, it's not a strong signal there. These may be simulations as well. It's hard to tell. All right. I think that's everything in this paper, though. Is, yeah, is that's everything for this paper. So let me go to the PDF. So I believe this is the larger paper. And mm -hmm. again, I will just focus right. Yeah, on this has here. the details about the synthesis of the material. Um, so yeah, this is what's confusing a bunch of people is you start with the lead sulfate and then you use copper phosphide and you get uh, lead copper phosphate. And then where's the sulfate go? Well, the sulfate's the surrounding salt. 
it's still there. It's not going away. And it's it's not a homogeneous material at the end. Um, this this paper, I believe, at the end of it, we'll we'll we'll, we'll poke around the citations. But uh, the citations of this paper, uh, interestingly, they refer to a lot of geophysics. Uh, so lanarkite is a, a mineral in nature, and uh, they basically referred to the geophysics papers in order to figure out how to grow lanarkite in, under controlled conditions. Uh, that's that's how a lot of these artificial compounds are eventually like. Well, I mean, there's some that aren't really available in nature so much, but uh, anyway, uh, in in this case, they were lucky that it, it was a natural mineral out out there in nature somewhere, and they were able to use that information to make the phosphate oxide material. If we uh, go down, further, okay. Um, and yeah, the the fact that they're using sulfates and and phosphates in there uh, that's been confusing some people, I think. But the, the final actual superconducting material that they claim is superconducting, that's the phosphate, not the sulfate, as far as I can tell. Um, this is more simulations in the software. Uh, oh, this is an X-ray diffraction pattern. Interesting. Um, if we can scroll down a little, maybe. Ah, OK, so there's peak shifts. OK, so um, they're showing that the X-ray diffraction is altered by the doping with the copper, in a um, in a in a way that they think uh, indicates superconductivity, or maybe this is just more data on the material. It's hard to say. Maybe further down the whole Okay. And and if you want, I can go down to the next page. And this one. Yes. Yeah. This is interesting. So this is what I was talking about earlier. With um, okay. you have um, the copper ion introduced in each of these. You have these vertical structures in the material, and the copper ion is is causing lattice induced strain, and the lattice induced strain um, is similar is a similar effect to compressing the material, which distorts the lattice. Um, so um, this is this is how they're doing that, and it's interest. It's actually really interesting, and this is a little more controversial. But like a lot of people have been talking about ormus and stuff. I, I recall there was one fellow in uh, in Jeremy's orbit, uh, Daniel Foster, I believe, uh, he was uh, mentioning like uh, 1D materials uh, as well as 2D materials. So you have a material that's like you've got some flat surfaces like graphene. Well, instead of that, it's possible to have a material which is just tubes in a uh, vertical configuration with van der Waals forces in both directions around that. Um, uh, okay. And um, also, like, uh, when the, a lot of people, they talk about orbitally rearranged stuff, well, lattice-induced strain sounds a lot like orbit. So, I mean, I know that that field is more uh, woo-ish, but it's it seems to be adjacent to some real physics here because uh, you're not, like, totally changing the orbitals here, but you're certainly deforming the electron orbitals by this strain. Um, so maybe that Ormus stuff has some stuff to it. And they, they mentioned a lot of room temperature superconductors in that area, as well as with the 1D uh, van der Waals materials and stuff. Uh, I don't believe this is a van der Waals material, as far as I can tell. Um, but it does have these vertical structures along which they're uh, considering the superconductive uh, properties of this. Uh, okay. Although that's okay. somewhat standard of type 2 superconductors, too. Like a lot of people look at YIBCO and REPCO that way. Um, beyond that, um, what was the thing that they mentioned? Uh, the Jan Teller effect. Um, Jack Sarfati mentioned the Jan Teller effect a, a while back. That also has to do with um, lattice-induced strain uh, in, in these sorts of things. So, so maybe well, Ormus is uh, materials that have lattice-induced strain or Jan Teller effect behaviors. Um, yeah. So that's an interesting thought there, especially because they have superconductivity in Buckminster Fullerene with potassium. And it's well known that a uh, you, if you're using the Buckminster Fullerene as an ion, if it's ionically charged, then it exhibits Jan Teller effect because you're missing one electron on, on otherwise symmetric Buckminster Fullerene. So it's got a pinch somewhere. Okay. Interesting. Well, yeah. and it, it sounds like this lattice strain is one of the keys. Uh, as I recall, and I think Ranga Diaz had said this, um, I think the other the other key was the hydrogen atoms. I believe there was a paper that was published in the early 2000s that that 
kind of uh, put that, it highlighted that for physicists who were pursuing, or you know, chemists who were pursuing superconductivity. And at that time, uh, I remember him predicting that we would see lots and lots of breakthroughs uh, because basically the right pieces are in the right place. So yeah, it sounds you're like- getting, You were definitely getting to that point with this, uh, like there's enough pieces- that for engineering purposes, we can figure it. We, we still don't fully understand type two superconductivity, but there's enough pieces in place. There's enough data that we can, uh, especially now with AI, where you can sift through all that data in one thing and then come up with some ideas. Um, there's, yeah, right now there's plenty of data to work from to get to real solutions at this point. Um, but what was I going to say before that? Well, um, you know, if I could point out one other thing also, and I think that this is really important, is when you read about these breakthroughs, right, they make it sound so simple. But I mean, anyone who's been paying attention for the last few minutes, they have heard you run through so many engineering level details, right? I mean, there's a lot of chemistry there. You know, you have to deal with uh, manufacturing, heat differentials, defects, pulling things out. Um, there, there's a lot that goes into this. It is not as simple as, you know, magic superconductor appears if you mix the chemicals and heat it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what it takes to really get into these fields. It's uh, it's a lot of hard work, uh, but it's worth it in the end. I think anyone who wants to, is inspired by this sort of work should jump into it. And uh, yeah, it's going to be hard, but it's worth it in the end. I can guarantee you that. Um, okay, so here, here's a photo down at the bottom I believe they have a photo of the Meissner effect. Definitely. Yeah. So, well, so a lot of people are claiming this is diamagnetic. Um, the four simulations on ArcSiv that have so far been run all show band structure more similar to high temperature superconductors than to a highly diamagnetic material like uh, pyrolytic graphite, for example. So, uh, it looks like this may be genuine uh, Meissner effect based on those simulations. And that's preliminary. These are very preliminary results, but all four of the current simulations that are out have claimed that. Uh, we, I mean, we have to also remember that these scientists, they may also just be excited about the topic too. So they may have a, bi a bias. So, um, but so far it's looking very promising. Uh, there are two things to note here. Uh, this is a lead salt, so it's very dense. So uh, even compared to YBCO, like it's it's quite dense. So uh, even if it is, it is exhibiting the Meissner effect, uh, even with the same strength as YBCO, uh, the, the material is not likely to fully lift off the magnet. Um, second, I would really love to see people cool this down further so that the critical current is higher, so that you can actually get it floating. It may be possible to slightly cool this, like in a, a home refrigerator, and actually get it floating. Um, I'm not sure. I don't see flux pinning here, so I don't know if it will pin itself in place. Um, but if not, you can use uh, an array of four magnets, two south pointing up and two north, and uh, or you can use uh, a, uh, a ring magnet and a, and a single magnet inside the ring magnet. And then that'll create a potential well that even without the Meissner effect, it should levitate the sample. You can do the uh, same thing with uh, highly diamagnetic, like uh, pyrolytic graphite and other diamagnetic materials. Okay, wonderful. And let me see, I will scroll down a little more. And then I, I think after we finish this paper, that that's probably enough for our audience for one day. Uh, We've definitely run through a lot of big pieces. Um, let me see. So temperature dependence of resistivity, and uh, this kind of goes to what you were saying, right? So yeah. Um, so so you can see here um, at around 100 C, it's uh, the resistivity drops, but not to zero. And this is what a lot of people are saying is they think that it's not a real superconductor because this doesn't drop to zero. Uh, there's a few things here. So first. It depends what they're using to measure the resistivity. So uh, if they're not using a four-point probe, they're still going to have some contact resistance at the interface between the probe tips and the superconductor. And your system will pick that up. Um, so they really need to use a four-point probe uh, to test this. 
if not some other uh, method of detecting superconductivity. Um, so they may not have had a four point probe. Second, because it's not a homogeneous material and there's a non superconducting phase present, um, this may be contact resistance from the non superconducting phase that's mixed in. And they might not, it's going to be difficult to get a single crystal of the superconductor large enough. It, that's So we'll probably see in the next week or so a lot of very small crystals of this material. And then in a, a week or a month, once we've had people who have had more time to grow the crystals, then we'll start seeing stuff that's like maybe a centimeter across and then eventually larger. And then um, as people develop the processes to manufacture this stuff, then we'll have actual practical applications. Um, I think that will take a little more time, but we'll see. But yeah, I'd love to see this thing fully floating. If someone just puts it in their freezer and then just like gives it that extra bit of Meissner effect, I think that'd be really cool to see. Um, anyway. Okay. Yeah, and so let me go down to these. So, I mean, yeah, these are just more superconducting transition temperatures. Um, what's this? At, uh, oh, wait, uh, sorry, uh, transition. This this is, sorry, this is the critical current again up here. And then further down, uh, volts versus amps. Yeah, critical current measurements. Wonderful. Uh, Wonderful. Under various and... conditions. Okay, and then I think we have one more, and I think this is our last graph. Yeah, it is. So, yeah, so um, this is a rough graph of the basic idea. Of, they, they're saying that there's these, uh, there's a, uh, and, and the the simulations that have come out with density density field theory, those appear to say the same thing roughly. And that's that uh, there's two uh, energy levels relevant for this in the band structure. Um, and there's the superconducting band and there's the uh, insulating or metallic band. And as you dope with copper, you're getting into the right spot for this effect to happen. But uh, this is a very rough graph and it's relating to the text underneath it. So we, we don't need to go into too much detail, but it's interesting to look, uh, if anyone's curious, to look at the references and see how they synthesize this based off of knowledge from geophysics where lanarkite forms naturally and uh, uh so I, I think let's let's jump through the other uh what would the what were the other papers listed well so most uh, of the briefly. others that you listed were simulations and i think it, right. you know so what I, let's it, jump, let's avoid the simulations then because i already mentioned that there was uh yeah one, and then you did one you team did was have amusing. some one team was amusing because they um uh, they were like, "Oh, we're we're making some, but we don't think it'll work." That's literally that's literally like what their uh, their thing on okay. Arxiv says. It's it's funny. <laughs> yeah, that one was not. Yeah, like they, well, they haven't actually even finished synthesizing it, and they're already like, "Eh, we're we're, we're grumpy." Whatever. Anyway. Uh, yeah. Well, then Andrew Cote. Andrew Cote just posted. Uh, let's see, what did he say? Um, first independent measurement of zero resistance in LK ninety nine. Uh, in uh, Nanjing, China. Uh, he just posted that a few hours ago, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and there, yeah, there they have it. They're talking about it. Yeah, and and again, those are Twitter links. I will put the Twitter links up in the story for us. So yeah, um, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, Boulder, Colorado, Shang National Laboratory. They're they're all working on this. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I would definitely check out Andrew Cote's. Uh, review of the stuff for anyone who has other questions as well. He's very thorough. Wonderful. Well, Michael, on that note, let me thank you so much for your time today. We have given people more than enough to chew on for today. Thank you for giving us a, an amazing run through on it as well. And the thing that struck me was, again, it is not like a black and white issue. It is not crystal clear. This is an engineering and chemical synthesis issue. And there are a lot of bits and pieces to it. But as you mentioned, we'll be seeing probably uh, a little bit larger crystals over the next few days. And as people have more time to grow them, they will get larger. And then at some point we will start to see, you know, like industrially useful materials. But with this particular chemistry, we're probably not going to see a heck of a lot because it's low milliamp critical current. Well, not at room temperature. You can still cool this thing and we don't know how high the critical current can go. Usually if it superconducts at high temperatures, that means if you cool it down more, the critical current gets very useful. Uh, okay. But yeah, there, there's a lot of engineering challenges to overcome still. 
maybe so the authors apparently tried to publish this around the same time as the other guy with the hydrogen uh, compound. And because of the controversy around that, they didn't get their publications through in nature. Uh, so they've been working on this for three, maybe five years. Um, and uh, I would not be surprised if um, privately they already have un overcome some of the engineering problems associated with the, this material. So we'll just have to see. Michael, thank you again so much for your time today, sir. You're welcome. Thanks for having me.